Good afternoon. This is the last segment of IPv6 only. I'd like to thank Jose for taking the floor in the previous part. And finally, we'll have Wesley Correa now. Hello, Wesley is Brasilero, vive in Paraguay, amigo de la casa desde hace muchos años, ha ayudado for many years now and has assisted us a lot in so many things. <laughs> he has helped like Nick on so many occasions, videos, courses. He travels all over Latin America, giving courses on IPv6, on GPON, and many other topics. And he will be telling us about NAT64 with DNS64 and also on another topic, SITDC. So Wesley is owner of Telecom GSP Solutions. You have an hour and a half. You have the floor, Wesley. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session of our tutorial on IPv6. I would like to start this session of the tutorial speaking about something that I consider is very important for the ISPs. Since April 24, 2024, we started with storms in the south of Brazil. These storms almost wiped out cities. About 100 persons have died and more than 100 are missing. Now, why am I speaking about this? What does that have to do with IPv6? What does that have to do with ISPs? Let me show you. Can you see my screen? So I want you to look at this, what we have on the screen. Please pay attention. That is just one of the ISPs in this region who is struggling to maintain connectivity of the clients. Now, why? Because in situations such as these, many of those who have disappeared cannot communicate with other members of the family. Many of those who have disappeared very often are awaiting help or assistance from someone who can go and rescue them, and they have no ways of communicating. So these ISPs are out there risking their lives in order to maintain this network active. So what I wanted to tell you on this occasion is that the work that you carry out in your countries, in your field, in the places where you work is extremely important. This is not just about distributing internet services. This is a public service. This is a service that can save lives. So think about it like that. And now I would like to ask all of you to give a big round of applause to those who, for you, who day to day make efforts to keep your clients connected in the most difficult situations that might arise. So that was my message. Now let us speak about IPv6, which is equally important as that, because without IPv6, we have no internet. So let us speak about IPv6 only networks with NAT64 and with DNS64. <clears throat> so let's have this up on the screen. So. This is a brief introduction of myself. I am CEO and founder of Telecom ISP Solutions, a company that provides solutions to ISPs in more than 20 countries. Among these, we have capacity building, mentoring, as well as software solutions to assist 
ISPs in many different kinds of situations in their daily work. I'm also a speaker and facilitator at LACNIC and have been so since 2018. I also give conferences in other events, like Ali said, and I'm also a private pilot. And when I write that I'm a private pilot, I have to answer one question that many people already asked me. And it took me some time to reflect on this and figure out an answer. What does have being a pilot have to do with being a telecom engineer, working with networks or working with ISPs? What does this have to do with that? What are the similarities between the two things? And let me ask you a question. Most of you took a flight to come to Panama to this event. So would you board a plane if you knew that the commander of that plane did not respect the checklist prior to taking off? Yes or no? Would you have boarded the plane? No. Okay. So why should you trust your business or a connection to the home or a connection to your business to an ISP that does not follow the standards and the technical standards that have been established for the different things we do, such as IPv6 implementation, building FTTH networks, implementing and manipulating routing policies, secure routing, BGP protocols. Now, why? We just saw the importance of having an ISP network to save lives. So, equally so, uh, and in the same way as a pilot would respect the checklist, the same should be the case for a network engineer respecting the standards that have been established to implement and carry out tasks. Now, let us speak about NAT64 and DNS64. In the context of ISP networks, what is NAT64? NAT64 is the protocol responsible for translating IPv4 addresses into IPv6 and is based on RFC 6052. So this translation, we can say, takes place through a prefix that is selected and defined by the ISP. This is a range in the slash 96. And we can use the same range established in the same RFC, which is 66 colon FF, G9, B, etc. But why 96? If we take away 128 bits of an IPv6 address with the 96 bits from this block, from this range, we then have 32 bits. In other words, the 32 bits of the host segment are compatible with the 32 bits of the IPv4 addresses. So these same 32 bits can support all the IPv4 addresses that exist in the world. This technique, NAT64, does the uh, conductor a uh, literal translation from IPv4 to IPv6 without any expressive uh, changes in the packet. So the packet leaves origin of, as a packet in IPv6. Let's under, and we are going to understand how that happens. For instance, if if a host that is IPv6 only, it's a device that only has IPv6, wishes to access a site, a website that has only an A entry that corresponds to an IPv4. We already know that uh, the two protocols do not uh, communicate with each other. So what do we need? We need someone, somebody to interpret that, to translate that between the two protocols to establish communication. Now, in this case, the communication is not directly established because uh, the IPv6 uh, host does not know how to establish connection with uh, an IPv4 destination. Now, when the host uh, tries to have access to this uh, IPv4 destination, DNS64 will create a quad A entry 
uh, corresponding to IPv6 for the host to be able to access a uh, an IPv4 only destination uh, using uh, translation. In this process, DNS64 is very important because it will be responsible for creating uh, an IPv6 uh, entry or address for a website that uh, lacks it. So without DNS64, uh, there is no way we can use that DNS function. So when the packet leaves origin, whether the uh, destination address in IPv6 with the block slash 96, that, uh, that is the one that uh, corresponds to our translation, this packet will be intercepted by the router or uh, BNG and will be re addressed. Uh, so we will do a, a PR uh, routing policy. Whatever comes to this destination, to this block, we are going to direct it to NAT64. And in NAT64, we uh, translate it. NAT64 will take this packet and translate it to IPv4 based on the last 32 bits. It sends the packet to the internet and uh, as it receives uh, the result, as it uh, uh, stores uh, the state, it keeps it in IPv6 uh, to the uh, host that had requested it initially. We already talked about DNS64. We talked a bit. However, the real function of DNS64 is to create these entries a, a quad a to the for these domains that only have a entries it's a it creates a compatibility and to provide communication it works on this the 96 la porción de host the portion host will always represent the standard of DNS 64, we can find it in RFC 6147, that RFC specifies what uh, DNS 64 does. Where can we uh, configure DNS 64 today? Most uh, DNS uh, open source solutions allow us to configure and some uh, payment ones also allow it. The most common ones are bind and bound. And they work very well for our purposes in DNS 64. How would the flow of a traffic be with originating in an IPv4 only host and destined to an IPv4 host? Here we have the IPv6 only host, and here we condense the BNG, the router, the board, all of those functions in one single place to understand what NAT64 does together with DNS64. The host wishes to access a domain, xpto.com, and he, it has only an A entry. So how does it do it? it uh, sends a query from the domain to the DNS64 and DNS64 here in the middle section. We see the little arrow. The answer will not be IPv4 because precisely the function of DNS64 is active in this DNS server, so the response will be 64 semicolon um, F, 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 B, 9B, um, semicolon, semicolon, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, this corresponds to a host part of uh, the address. Now, with this address in our hands, the device will not know that the destination is an IPv4 only destination. And why not? Because the host receives from the DNS, received an IPv6 address. The address is an IPv6 address. So the connection gets started with 64 um, uh, FF9B uh, um, 
semicolon, semicolon, colon, colon, now one, two, three, four, five, six. And when we complete the task, it is that NAT64 starts to operate. NAT64 picks that packet, picks the host portion of this packet, converts it again to 32 bits in IPv4, and sends it packet to the internet as if it were original and uh, uh, IPv4 native. And from uh, from IPv4, then uh, the packet uh, leaves. And uh, of course, you store the state of this uh, because of this connection because we need traceability, so we can know who to return uh, the uh, requisition for opening. Uh, so we reach the uh, website or the destination. The destination is IPv4 only, and it will accept the connection because the originator of the connection is a device in uh, IPv4. So it started in IPv4 by an IPv4. So the response for opening the connection is uh, sent uh, using I, um, IPvP. Not 64 gets picks that uh, connection opening and notices that it corresponds to user X or IPv6X or identifier X. So it will try to once again turn this packet into an IPv6 uh, packet and redirect it to the IPv6 only network until the packet reaches the host that had uh, requested the connection originally. So what we have here in the middle is a translator. Imagine that you move to China or Korea or Russia or India. What would be easier for you in the short term? to learn the language or to hire a translator. Sure, a translator, that's for the short term. A translator will solve everything. Now, you went there with your couple, the two spouses, and they started having children and grandchildren. So, is it interesting to uh, hire a translator for each of you as you keep uh, the roots of your Spanish language if you live in India? Or is it smarter if you learn the new language so you can save that translation task? So, what I want you to understand is that NAT64 and DNS64 are transition techniques. These are techniques that should not be kept forever. They must be there until IPv4 loses relevance in the Internet, and then we will quit using it. Why? Because the networks will continue to grow, and if IPv4 continues to be relevant, what are we going to need to further expand our NAT64 to support the number of users that continues to grow in our business? So, whenever possible, give the native IPv6 and use the best transition techniques available to reach the target. So here, this slide summarizes everything I explained in the previous slide using the flowchart. When the host tries to resolve a domain name, for a destination that only that has an A entry, that is, that corresponds to IPv4, DNS automatically generates a forged entry to, for this IPv4, but it, uh, it includes IPv6 entries so that the packet may leave IPv6 uh, in a native form uh, from origin that was IPv4 only. Uh, IPv6 only, it has no IPv4. <coughs> and there we have, that's a, a, a terminal, or not a white chart, but a, a, a screenshot showing how it would be an IPv6 only to an IPv4 address. <coughs> there we have, for instance, ping 664, uh, <coughs> semicolon ff 9 b semicolon semicolon 8.8.8.8. So here you see that NAT64 bits in hexadecimal 
converted the 32 bits in hexadecimals, and the response comes through ICMP from destination, from the destination that we are invoking the pin. The echo reply comes, and NAT64 converts it into IPv6, and I receive the response of a pin in IPv6. Both ways, it's transparent both ways. It's not uh, transparent just for the translator, but for the destination, the, communi the IP uh, communication is native IPv4, and uh, for the destination, it's native IPv6. That, uh, well, it's repeated. Let's see our scenario for this lab. Here, this material, you can download it. It's in uh, the website of LACNIC. In this link, you have uh, some uh, documents that you can use to guide your way. Now, let's go to the lab. Here, we have the lab. We have this scenario. This is a very common uh, scenario in most uh, ISPs. Here we have the border router. Here we have a BNG. It's a, uh, an IPv6 only BNG. We have a CPE and we have a desktop station. Here we have NAT64 and DNS64. And here we have the web server that will be part of the second part of this tutorial. Let's start by going checking what we have here in the MicroTix. Then what we're going to do is to clean all the configuration of NAT64, DNS64. We're going to do that together. And we're going to see how it works and whether it really works. Well, hopefully it will, because sometimes uh, live demos uh, get, uh, surprise us. So let's enter this border. Vamos a agarrar aquí cuál es la dirección IP versión 6 que está configurada para abrir el Winbox. Es el 2602. Allá la tengo. 2602. Vamos a ingresar en el Winbox por IPv6 porque... No hace sentido yo estar aquí diciéndoles redes IPv6 only y yo estoy ingresando en el Winbox por IPv4. Entonces, entre corchetes vamos a ponerle ahí la dirección IPv6. No hagan eso, gente. Por favor, DNS existe para que no usemos direcciones literales para esa clase de cosas. ¿Ok? Entonces, a cada router ustedes van a crear una entrada. Borde, punto, etcétera, nombre del ISP de ustedes, zonas internas que no se propaguen hacia afuera, que hagan falta que te conectes por VPN para que puedas acceder a la gestión de un router. Pero aquí es laboratorio, aquí estamos to management. aprender. Bueno, voy a conectarme a este router. So I'm going to connect to this border router. Don't use one at the end because we don't want that to be scanned. So here have FACA. Now at border router, we're going to go to BGP in the routing. I have a BGP connection that has been established, which is announcing this block. Routing BGP advertisement sprint. So this is announcing a block which is slash 41 to the internet. IPv4 just has private addresses that I'm going to use here in this scenario to provide addressing to the NAT64. 
So what we're interested in here is what is the path of IPv6 until my device so it can receive this IPv6 only. So I'm going to open another instance of the Winbox. I'm going to connect this through Roman. Roman. I'm going to implement IPv6. I'm not going to put this because Roman doesn't work, but that's not at all the case. It does work. So let's have a look at the BNG. BNG is the router that concentrates the connections. This is a concentrator. So this router over here would normally let us to go would let us go out to an aggregation switch or whatever. But that's not the point. What do we have here then? Routing OSPF. Let's have a look and see if we have an IPv6 address over here. Yes. I have an OSPF, which is propagating and redistributing connected routes as well as static routes. These are then redistributed towards the border. What I have over here is a DHCP v6 server. I don't need to explain what prefix delegation is because we had a wonderful tutorial on prefix delegation and DHCP v6 a few minutes ago. This is a DHCP server in v6 with a pool of 43 to 56 because this is a lab. What we do need over here is an IPv6 with RA enabled so that the CPE can have connectivity because in this case, I'm not interested in SP having connectivity and conducting ping tests, but it is not necessary, as Kotua said earlier today, it is not necessary to enable this advertise or to send a global unicast address to a CPE. If you think that in your scenario you won't need this, then just don't send it because what the CPE needs is to provide routing from one place to another, and this can be done directly with a CDHCP client. So this is the end of the path. This is the default path. The default path I received through BCP. So over here, if I do ping, I have this reply. I have the default route. This is a block that I'm announcing through OSPF to the border, and the border is this announcing this through BGP outwards. Let us now go and check the CPE. Now, what the TP has a GHCPv6 client that receives the block and creates a pool called ISP. That's a pool name, as Kotua explained a while ago. And from this pool, I'm taking an address. The address over here is from pool ISP. I'm taking one address only, and I put advertise. This Ether2 port in the scenario is the port that goes directly to the desktop. It goes directly to my station, which at this very moment should only have IPv6 at this very moment. So let us test this out. Let us open the station. It will also have IPv4 through the netting, but let us delete everything from the server so we can have it running. So let us to ping here. 
we have connectivity in IPv6 directly from over here. Now let us check IP address show. And what do we have of IPv4 over here in this device? I don't, I cannot zoom in. We just have a loopback, which is of no use at all. So this means that if I try to access this, for example, if we try to access ipv6.google.com, This is slow because the lab is slow. And then there's another detail, which is the limitation of the CHR. The DNS didn't open. It might be the DNS, let's see. We don't have DNS, so let us figure out a solution. I was missing the sudo. Let's see if we can do the ping without the DNS. And now we have IPv6 connection, native IPv6 connection. Now if we try to access ipv4google.com over here, this won't open. So let's see why. Dig ipv4.google.com in 8888, see if it works. It doesn't work because I don't have IPv4. So I have to do the DNS query to my PV6. Now, the dig, as I mentioned, as Alejandra mentioned, is a wonderful friend. It gave me seven replies and tells me that the access is through these addresses. They're all pure IP4. That's why it's not going to work. So now we have to start doing magic, black magic. Who is the parent of black magic? This is a concept in the telecom networks that I learned in 2023 when I was providing a capacity a tutorial in Bogota. The issue of black magic works hand in hand with the invisible service. So these are things that should not occur, but they do occur. They don't solve things on their own, but they do so. And the bosses never believe that one solved things. It's an invisible service. It solved everything on its own. So here we have the parents of black magic and of the invisible service. So I just love to learn and I learn something every day from my students. So here it's going to delete the entire configuration of this NAT64 and we will start to play around this year. <coughs> So this is our lab guide. <laughs> okay, this over here in the chat. Okay, let me see. Oh, entonces, déjame. Chat. All right, so that people understand what is happening. 
Someone in the Zoom asked for the link to the lab, and they are entering this in the Zoom link, in the Zoom chat. Here you have the downloadable information that you have in LACNIC's site. So this is the second last slide of my presentation. All right. So step one, setting up the clean setup of Debian. It's Debian 10, it's old, but it works perfectly well in the new ones. And here I have a couple of configurations of IP addresses. Now, I don't like to do configurations up here because it's not so easy to cut and paste or copy and paste. So let me provide connectivity through IPv6. I'm going to do this through SSH with all the configurations I need because I can zoom in the screen and you can see this better. All right, so here we have the NS4 address, which is this one over here, 26602 IP6. Add 2602 F9E09F1 colon colon B and S4, yeah, S4. All right, so ping sex 2602 F9E0. I missed something. Let me check 2602. Let's check. Of course, IP link set as for so the interface faces down, it won't ping anywhere. Of course, that is obvious. There you have the troubleshooting and the black magic. Of course, and it's in the black screen. You're not seeing anything because I'm <laughs> doing this. All right. IP It's impossible here. Okay, it's in the IP net. So let's solve this over here. It's an F, and let's see over here. Let's see if we manage to have access here. So over here, we are going to put SSH. Debian at 2602. <coughs> F9E09F. So I think you can now see this better.
All right. There we go. So what I did was to add, let me put history here. It's not going to work. So what I did was to add an IPv6 address and a default route in order to be able to access this router through SSH. So what I'm going to do now is to load this configuration in my local RFC and reboot the machine and For those of you who don't know the local RC, rc.local, this is one of the oldest ways. I'm not going to say efficient, but it's one of the oldest ways of loading configurations in the boot. A bunch of A's. Ready. Now, let's uh, copy and paste. So we'll go faster. What I'm doing here is converting this file into an executable uh, file, execute the service. Let's see its status. Let's uh, zoom it out a bit to see the complete screen. Compatibility. Oh, sure. Because it's only been configured in uh, the network interface. That's why it doesn't allow me. Let's reboot it and see if it works. Because, as I said earlier, in real life, in the show, things do not uh, turn out the way we would have liked. Ping six. No subió la dirección. Vamos a poner la manual y volver a ingresar. So let's put all and uh, enter again. Ready.
Vamos a copiar esto. Let's copy this and paste it here directly. And yes, that's ready. The only thing missing is the last one, IP address, show. Yes. So here I have the IPs. Okay, let's monitor this. Let's uh, track it. And now let's install Joule. Let me see whether I have the DNS. I do. So APT update. Vamos a ver cuánto está consumiendo esto. Let's see how much it is uh, using up here. It's not there, it's in the border. Déjame si Let me let me see whether I can license this. Y el otro también. And the other one too. Esta es la CP. And this is the IP. Para que entienda. For you to understand what I'm doing, I'm licensing the macro ticks just to release the bandwidth, not internet connection. Let's see. Yes, there's internet connection. Yes. Yes, there's internet connection. What might be happening is that maybe it's not uh, working through, the licensing is not working because it's IPv6, because in the border I have IPv4 and we just discovered a, a small detail of the server that is licensed with uh, Microtik. So the license for IPv6 is not working. Yes? Exactly. Sorry, I missed what uh, the comment was. So let me do the following. Es el lo siguiente. ¿Dónde está PNG y P? Sí. Voy a ponerle aquí una. Solamente para licencia. Just uh, to license. Uh, if not, we're going to spend all afternoon here. Wasting it. Already. That's all I want. No more IPv4. Mm -hmm. Ready. We already updated uh, the list of the repositories. Now the next step, Instalar el install Linux headers, in this case of this uh, installation of Debian, it's already installed. 
But I leave it there so that you may take it into account. What we need here to install uh, the uh, Jung for APT is to change uh, the sources dot list. So let's replace the word buster for testing in slash etc slash resolve no apt sources dot list and here where i have buster the rest uh, are all well here you we put testing instead of buster Perfect. Now we enable forwarding between IPv4 and IPv6 in both. We are here transforming our Linux into a router. APT update again. Let's see. APG. This, uh, I'd seen this error before. No pop key. I think I'll have to do something here. GPG, no pop key. I might have to download this here. GPG. The Google exists to help us in the black magic. And the chat GPT for the invisible services. The key won't load. Hmm? Sí, no tengo. Estoy instalando justo el. Yes, the jewel is uh, speaking there. No voy a encontrar justamente porque el, yo necesito el. I w it won't allow me in because I need the update. Testing is not seen. Is not signed. Yes, exactamente. And this is exactly the same one. Let's see whether this one works. This is the same one. Sí. Ah. <laughs> yes. Pero yo instalé el key server. So I installed this. This was a key server. Sí. No, no, no va. Justamente porque necesito cargar el, el repositorio. So I need to load the repository, and the repository is only in the testing. Cool. Ah. 
Bueno, vamos a probar con este. Con el de Ubuntu. Mm. Ya, ya fue. Yo cargué con este, con este. So I loaded it with the key server of Ubuntu. So now apt install jewel. Of course, apt update. Now why? Claro, me falta el restante del comando. Sí. Instalando el Joule. So it's installing the jewel. Sepan que todo eso fue so this was all on purpose to show you the power of black magic. Sí. ¿Sabes que? Well, you know, I need to slim a bit, so this sort of made me sweat a bit here. <laughs> now it stopped sharing. Now when we have magic, it stopped sharing. Now that we had the magic. Okay, there we are. Jewel has been installed. Now, what do we need to do? basic configuration of NAT64. Once again here, this is basic configuration. In the Joule manuals, there is a lot of information that you can use to improve setting up the Joule and the configuration. So I can give you a couple of suggestions. For example, looking up some previous presentations of Henry Godoy. Henry has implemented Joule at the University of Campinas with purely IPv6 scenarios and delivering this to mobile phones, tablets, and so on, and it works perfectly well. So over here, configuration of Joule, basic configuration for NAT64, mode probe Joule, Joule instance at default net filter, pool 6, 64, FF9B, colon, colon, slash, 9, 6. So let us put mode probe Joule, Joule instance at default, net filter, Pool 6, 74, 64, FF9B, colon, colon, slash, 9, 6. So over here we have an instance of NAT64. If I put Joule stats display, it's going to show me a couple of things that I have here. Now, why is this over here? It's not black magic. Let me show you how this got here. B and G. So, in this scenario, in this diagram, we have the jewel, which is having IPv6 connection through the BNG because I did it over here. It's not because it has to be do, to be done through the BNG. Now, how this packet address to this network, how can it reach the jewel? If we enter the BNG version 6 routes, 
we have a route of NAT64 showing that all the packets with destination or routed with destination 64 colon ff 9b colon colon slash 96 will then be forwarded to 2602F9E09F1B. IP hyphen six address show. So let's see if we have this address. This is 9F1B. 9F1B is in our NS4, which is connected over here. It's E1. NS3 is E0 and NS4 is 1. So this means that some packets are being forwarded to the jewel. So let's test this out. In the desktop, Let me check something. View zoom in. I think that's better. Ya tenemos. So over here, we have okay ping IPv6. Now let us have a look and see if we have the ping through the NAT64. Ping 664 colon colon f f nine b colon colon eight point eight point eight point eight so over here we have black magic black magic so that just gives us a ping if I wish to access content in IPv so I still don't have content in IP4 because I don't have DNS 6.4. So for DNS 6.4, Installation. let us follow, follow these steps. App install unbound. Henry Godoy in the chat says that the repositories didn't have IPv6. These were not in IPv6. That is why we have this error with the signature. So let us look at the file of unbound.conf. I'm just going to copy and paste. And let me explain what we're doing here. etc unbound.conf. So what do we have over here? I enabled the server. I put interface 0000, colon, colon, 0. Now, this is not so that you can copy it and paste it in your unbound. Please don't do that. This is a lab scenario. So I'm putting that all the interfaces will be listening in IPv4. All the interfaces will be listening in IPv6. This, this is very, very summarized. This is an unbound file that I used so that IPv6 works using DNS 6.4. Now, this access control over here has my network slash 40. This network is one of our blocks from my, our academia that we use for tutorials. And over here, we enable the module of the DNS 6.4 validator. I will put the DNS 6.4 prefix, which is this one here, 64 colon FF9B colon colon slash 96. So let us now reboot the unbound, restart the unbound, and
invalid character. So let's check over here. Unbound. Check conf. Right. I don't realize this over here. Thank you. You can see better than me. Start equal I'm uh, missing something of the unbound. And we're going to remove these two modules over here. So it must be the quote sign. So I will figure out later on why I'm getting these errors in the DNS 6.4. Let's try this with Google's DNS 6.4. And in the meantime, so this has to be in brackets. square brackets. Sí, vamos, vamos a probar eso. Gracias, Ariel. Okay, thank you, Ariel. And we're now going to start the service with the unbound. Perfect. Perfect. Now, technically, IP hyphen six address show. If I pick any of these IPv6 and I use it in the bit, it should work. And then dig. Dig abc.com.py at, and then I put the, the IPv4 address. Time it out. Why? Yes, it's in the list. Let me try this dig here from the PC. Yes. To 
2602 F9E0 9F 1B Let's see whether this gets solved. In quotation marks, value data. Let's see whether magic works. Let's try. Yes, let's try with Google DNS64 and then I pledge to record this content for you and I, with this same link, I'm going to uh, give it to you again. That's what I commit myself to do. So here, DNS64, we are using Google's. I gave a dig to this domain abc.com.py that is IPv4 only. They have no IPv6. So here I, we have the response 64F9B, uh, colon, colon, 23BE, colon, uh, 2BED. So if, if here I change the DNS, TC resub.com sudo was missing ready Entonces, ahora, si yo doy un ping 6 abc. I give a ping 6 comma um, uh, py automatically it will answer with ipv6 of NAT64. And now what we need to know is whether this site gives you access abc.com.py. Yes, it does. IPv4.google.com too. Two destinations that own that have IPv4 only in their A entries. Let's try here. Dig abc.com.py. 
at uh, 201, etc. Entry A only and DNA 64 did the magic of turning the last 32 bits of IPv6, of IPv4 in hexadecimal and make it really work so you can access. Okay, we have time for questions now. The next tutorial, the next part of the tutorial would be the year seat part. I'm go the SIT. I'm going to show the slides and together with the DNS 64 part that I'm going to record for you, I'm also going to record SIT and to um load this uh, and so you may ha and you i'll give you my email address just in case you have questions no this is not a question it's a clarification i think it's important in earlier tutorials rather than speaking of nat64 and dns we have talked about 464x lat and i think it's important because maybe some people here were not present in previous tutorials so net 64 and you know, 64 are valid only when an enterprise or a residential has all the devices and all the OSs and all the apps with IPv6 because if not what they need actually is a step beyond uh, NAT64 DNS64 that is 464XLAT right right clarified well thank you for the clarification Jordi 2000% correct. The good thing about having clear concepts of NAT64 is that you are much closer that so that if tomorrow you read 464xlat in the internet seat, uh, seat DC and if you don't understand what NAT64, if you understand how NAT64 works, the rest is much easier. So this is the foundation for the rest, this little piece of NAT64. So Jordi, I want to thank you. So let's wait until all these, uh, uh, get this gets updated. All these uh, presentations will remain in uh, uh lacnic 41 and i wouldn't be surprised to see in that uh, this appears to or is already has already been uploaded to so if you have any questions uh, doubts complaints everything will be welcome yes I see that you were using my critique. I'd like to know whether, well, NAT64 and DNS64 may run on a MicroTIC and whether you recommend that. Unfortunately, no, no. Unfortunately, I, I wish I could. And complimenting your question, it would be much easier if NAT64 and 464 XLAT supported MicroTIC because most of you here with a couple of clicks you could implement it and have it in your network now whatever depends on that black magic that we saw here comp compiling it and doing that it's not just anybody that posts and manages early uh, today we were talking about uh, solutions at lunch we discussed that open source uh, uh, solutions for ixps they are wonderful beautiful it, as long as there is somebody that can take care of them so most solutions need uh, in most cases you need to pay 
David uh, Wesley. I managed to take this implementation to a step before production. Now, what problem did I run into? We, I had problems when I went through the captive portal that is not based IPv6. So that was my Achilles heel because I absolutely lost the captive portal of the IPv6 only solutions that I wanted to deploy. Is there any way you can solve this? I'm not aware. Yes, but it should work because what I understand that David is asking is about the MicroTix captive uh, portals that uh, for the validation depend of intercepting DNS and doing uh, NAT and, and install OpenRO and forget MicroTix. I'm very sorry, MicroTix is very good hardware, very good solution, but Four or five years ago, I offered to help them develop all of this for free, and I'm still waiting for the, the answer. It's unacceptable. It makes no sense. Microtech only works when it has enough uh, addresses for dual stack, and that's it. Hola. Sí. I wanted to add a comment. Close up, please. Yes, I wanted to add a comment. It has to do, let's not forget, because we have several events and we've changed the topics, uh, going more in depth, uh, explaining details about IPv6 only. However, it's important to remember that all these transition mechanisms, such as uh, NAT64, DNS64, uh, IPv6 only, uh, uh, th they are going to be there for some time because to the extent that the space of the apps and the contents move toward IPv6, the traffic from 6 to 4 uh, is getting reduced. Uh, so we need to get to the real IPv6 only. So the transition mechanism solve transient problem. So NAT64 solves a problem that is six can't reach IPv4 only. However, our real target should be to have IPv4 only going toward IPv6. So these are temporary solutions, but sooner or later they won't have so much traffic because the idea is to move, to shift uh, toward IPv6 only. Because say the problem that is that is beyond our control because the problem is when you have websites and sometimes even banks, governments that continue to use IPv4. So indeed, it's the way you put it. This is a temporary mechanism, but it was designed by IETF for, to die on its own for apoptosis. So you may have a few services uh, IPv4 only. The traffic that goes through the NAT64 will be uh, gradually reduced, uh, but it's up it's, it's not up to us. Yes, but if we are going to try hard, well, we have to try hard for the versions to be there also in IPv6. The banks are always, they are always lagging behind. In my view, they should move toward IPv6, purely IPv6. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, we'll have to put an end to this tutorial. But before we leave, first of all, a round of applause for Wesley. Thank you, Wesley and Jose, wonderful tutorial. Personally, I'm not worried at all for any problems that you may have had in the tutorials because that's part of the web and you learn much more when things don't go right. Because when uh, things uh, come out right immediately, it's you don't learn. So I wanted to invite you to the welcome cocktail at 6.30 at uh, the foyer 
at 6.30. Tomorrow we'll resume at 8.30. So see you at 6.30 at the cocktail party and thank you for staying so late.